Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the uh, Office of National Drug Control Policy today for our webinar on medication-assisted treatment in prisons and reentry programs. Now I would like to hand off to our moderator, June Savelli. Thank you so much, Jamie, and thanks to everyone for taking the time to join us for today's webinar. The topic of today's webinar is medication-assisted treatment in prison and reentry programs, and it's both timely and important. In addition to an ex exceptional team of leaders and experts uh, who will share information about innovative approaches for integrating medication-assisted treatment in correctional settings, we're very fortunate that ONDCP Deputy Director Mary Lou Leary will be joining us today. Deputy D Director Leary oversees ONDCP's Office of Policy, Research, and Budget. Prior to her appointment to ONDCP, she was the Principal Deputy Assistant General, sorry, Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Justice Programs, a position she also held from 2009 to 2012. In between, she served as Acting Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Justice Programs for, from March 2012 through June 2013. Ms. Leary has 30 years of criminal justice experience at the federal, state, and local levels with an extensive background in criminal prosecutions, government leadership, and victim advocacy. And with that, I'll hand the floor over to Deputy Director Mary Lou Leary. Thanks, June. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today talk about medication-assisted treatment in prisons and in reentry programs. Uh, many thanks to our presenters today. As you all know, we are in the midst of an opioid epidemic. In 2015, an average of 144 people died from drug overdoses every single day in the United States. That's an increase of 12% over 2014, when an average of 129 people died of an overdose every day. In 2015, there were a total of 52,404 deaths in the United States um, due to drug overdose. It's really hard to imagine or to even visualize that uh, extent of a number, but it's more than the seating capacity of every major league ballpark except one. Nearly two-thirds of those overdose deaths involved an opioid like a prescription pain medication, heroin, or illicit fentanyl. And while data indicate that there is somewhat of a slowdown in the availability and the misuse of prescription opioids, heroin and illicit fentanyl use continue to be on the rise. As you know all too well, far too many people who need help for substance use disorder end up in jail or in prison rather than in treatment. When we fail to prevent substance use disorder or to identify and treat it in a timely manner, all too often it leads to one of two outcomes, death or incarceration. And when people with substance use disorder are incarcerated and do not receive treatment, the results can be devastating. One study of all inmates who were released from a state correctional system over a four-year period found that the risk of death among former inmates just during the two weeks following release from incarceration was 12.7 times that of the general population rate. And overdose deaths were a key driver of this phenomenon. A recent study in New York found that individuals who were incarcerated or on probation as a result of felony drug-related charges were 50% more likely to encounter the criminal justice system again if they did not receive substance use treatment. So correctional systems can play a central role in the way we respond to the opioid crisis and to substance use disorder in general. Correctional systems are at the crossroads where public safety and public health responses to drug use intersect. And reentry and recovery outcomes, of course, are intertwined with that. To improve these outcomes, we need to make better use of evidence-based treatment approaches, such as medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorders throughout our criminal justice system. We've made some progress in recent years, but we still have a long way to go. Medication-assisted treatment is actually the standard of care for opioid use disorder. FDA-approved medications are a proven method 
to help people with opioid use disorders achieve and sustain recovery. These medications include methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. They, are the, they should be the standard approach to opioid use disorder in correctional and other criminal justice settings as well, not the exception to the rule. That's why I believe that sessions like the one that we're having today and work being done uh, by the Bureau of Prisons, the National Institute of Corrections, and really enterprising correctional systems, such as the ones in Kentucky and Rhode Island, are critically important. They remind us that it's possible to provide evidence-based care in correctional settings, and that both reentry and recovery outcomes can improve as a result of that. With your help, medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder can become the standard of care in correctional settings for people who do have that opioid problems. And that will not only improve reentry and recovery outcomes, it will actually save lives. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to June for the rest to introduce our speakers. Thanks. Thank you so much, Deputy Director Leary. We're very fortunate to have key leaders and experts in corrections and in the use of medication-assisted treatment in correctional settings with us today. A.T. Wall is the director of the Rhode Island Department of Corrections and past president of the Association of State Correctional Administrators. He's going to open our session relating his experience overseeing MAT implementation in Rhode Island and speaking to the importance of MAT for opioid use disorders on behalf of the Association of State Correctional Administrators. He will be followed by Stephen Amos, Chief of the Jails Branch of the National Institute of Corrections, part of the Bureau of Prisons. He will talk about progress made in fostering the adoption of medication-assisted treatment in prisons and reentry programs, and about the resources available through the National Institute of Corrections and through the Bureau of Justice Assistance's Residential Treatment Training and Technical Assistance Program. He'll also tell us about the MAT and Corrections guidelines that Deputy Director Leary mentioned. Mr. Amos will be followed by Kevin Pangburn. Sorry, it's Dr. Amos. Dr. Amos will be followed by Kevin Pangburn, Director of the Kentucky Department of Corrections Substance Abuse Division. Kentucky passed Senate Bill 192, the Heroin Bill, in 2015, which authorized $3 million to the Department of Corrections to provide medication-assisted treatment to both county and state inmates. With these new resources, the Kentucky Department of Corrections has implemented MAT in nine Department of Corrections facilities, as well as four jails. Following, uh, following uh, Dr. Amos, Kimberly Kane, the Acting Medical Director of the Rhode Island Department of Corrections, will then describe Rhode Island's MAT efforts. The Rhode Island Department of Corrections is a combined prison and jail system that has implemented a statewide MAT program that offers all three FDA-approved medications, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. In 2016, the state budget included $2 million to expand medication-assisted treatment in prisons, allowing inmates to continue MAT for up to one year while incarcerated and to receive MAT prior to release. Finally, Dr. Andrew Klein, the project director for the RSAT TTA project, will briefly recap what we learned and conduct a question and answer session using questions you asked during registration. Dr. Klein will also remind you of how you can request assistance to implement, expand, or enhance MAT in your institutions and programs. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to Director Wall. Director Wall, are you on the phone? Are you on mute? Yes, I, wa I was on mute, my apologies. Welcome and take it away. Uh, certainly. Well, I begin by acknowledging that I don't profess to be uh, somebody with great expertise in medication-assisted treatment. I'm really a career corrections professional with 40 years of service, and I run, of course, a public safety agency. What I have seen over the course of my career is a shift in what's expected of the, the correctional system. Uh, it used to be that it was really sort of about the criminal mind, somebody lurking in the shadows ready to spring, and there's still plenty of that. But more recently, we've become uh, those who are expected to deal with problems of public health. Uh, 
mental illness and its first cousin substance abuse, for example. And because we have an ironclad no refusal policy, we can never say no if the court sends you our way, we become a cash basin uh, for those who have fallen through the cracks. Uh, the fact, however, is that uh, more than 50% of our current inmates uh, have problems of addiction. One in seven are opioid dependent. And as uh, one of my friends in the medical profession has said, uh, opioid dependence is consistent, predictable, all-consuming, chronic, relapsing, potentially fatal brain disease. The governor, to her credit, uh, established a task force to look at overdose prevention and to consider uh, ways in which Rhode Island, which certainly suffers from this scourge as much as uh, many of the states in the Northeast, uh, can use the as it will, occasion of incarceration to try to address uh, the problem. And she did dedicate the $2 million specifically to medication-assisted treatment, and that's not chump change in a state like ours. It certainly got our attention, and we have begun to ramp up the numbers uh, and the kinds of categories of inmates uh, being treated. We are, admittedly, a uh, conservative culture, Corrections tends to be risk averse. On the other hand, what we've seen is our personnel are really stepping up. Uh, it, many, many of our staff know people who are addicted to opioids and other dangerous substances. And they have been very willing to be trained uh, and to equip offenders uh, with strategies, Narcan being a uh, very important one. The staff uh, has saved a number of lives through the timely administration of Narcan. And we also, of course, are highly focused on uh, recovery. Sometimes people ask me, well, OK, you're a corrections agency. Uh, what, does, you know, what does this have to do with your mission? Aren't you simply replacing one uh, narcotic with another one? And my counter to that is that uh, this work that we're doing now uh, on the subject of uh, medication-assisted treatment is public safety. Uh, I mean, it is, uh, first of all, it's a safe and legal means to protect the user from harm, uh, even unto death. Uh, and second, uh, we're protecting the people of Rhode Island by reducing the risk of crime, because, of course, if someone is addicted, uh, they may stop at uh, nothing uh, to get a hold of what it is that they regard as their fix. I don't think I'm alone in this uh, respect. Uh, our, my counterparts in the Association of State Correctional Administrators, which is really the 50 corrections directors across the nation, uh, are all uh, looking carefully at what they can do on the occasion of somebody coming into the system with substance abuse issues. And a number of us, I'm proud that Rhode Island is one of them, a number of us really have claimed this mission. Uh, in a way that gives us and our staff a tremendous amount of satisfaction and really does contribute to the public good. Did we lose you or are you, are you finished? Oh, I'm finished. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was trying to be respectful of uh, time. <laughs> That's great. No, thank you so very much for those great remarks. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us and, and to hear um, on behalf of ASCA. So thank you so much. And now we want to turn it over to Dr. Amos, the chief of the, the jails um, section of the Bureau, of, the Bureau of Prisons. Good afternoon, uh, June, and thank you for those gracious introductions. Uh, the evidence of an opioid addiction crisis in America is absolutely over is just overwhelming. Uh, we hear it from every segment of our work environment. Um, and consequently, the National Institute of Corrections is working collaboratively with ONDCP and the Bureau of Justice Systems to identify and promote comprehensive medication-assisted treatment strategies uh, in support of state and local tribal correctional agencies to assist high-risk opioid use disorders among offenders transitioning. We all know that this is a vulnerable time and a time where we must focus our efforts. NIC, is, NIC has been working hard to design it responsive technical assistance training and peer-to-peer -peer learning vehicles to assist jurisdictions uh, in response to the national opioid epidemic. To do this, in early September, uh, and to address this challenge, NIC convened a national meeting of sheriffs, under-sheriffs, jail administrators of the largest jails in the nation. 
And in attendance were senior executives from ONDCP, the National Institute of Justice, uh, National Association of Counties, Middlesex County, Massachusetts, Sheriff Katusian, Council of State Governments, American Correctional Association, National Sheriff Association, National Commission on Correctional Health Care, and the National American Jail Association. And throughout this control process and this extensive body, strategies were identified and prioritized in partnership with ONDCP. And the following objectives were identified. One, establish and enhance identification and distribution of evidence-based practices, something that we are doing today and what we continue to commit ourselves to doing. Two, conduct technical assistance and training and develop centers of innovation. And these are the three-pronged approaches that NIC is taking in partnership with our colleagues to move the field forward. The proposed technical assistance efforts includes Again, identifying and cultivating centers of innovation as laboratories for promising practices. Developing and disseminating a self-guided assessment tool for the field. Providing specialized technical assistance training and coordinating with NIC networks to promote MAT, consistent with the needs of the field. The National Institute of Justice will provide evaluation support to these COIs. This is a MOU that we've been working through because we think it's important not only do we um, work to enhance these practices, but we work to ensure that we're doing the appropriate evaluations. What I would like to define a little more is what these centers of innovations are first. And it's, it's, a, it's an initiative in which we are customer, we're looking at a customer driven effort to design and expand our collective outreach um, to promote evidence based correctional capacity for correctional practitioners. We refer to these as our COIs. And this network consists of both prison and jail MAT programs. Currently, the prison MAT programs that we've identified as centers of innovation that we're working in partnership with BJA to support are Kentucky, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. For the jails, we have Barnstable, Massachusetts, Montgomery County, Maryland, and Sacramento, California, which will be coming on board in March of 2017. We fully anticipate that these sites will continue to expand upon we recognize that these sites have various strengths and challenges and, and, and experiences to share, and we think those experiences are very valuable. So we use these sites to, to identify and provide critical leadership and best practices, evaluation research, practicum, support, and training for correctional agencies. And one of the unique parts about that is, is in working with BJA, we're going to be able to fund and support um, who tech this, one of our Texas offerings is supporting these peer-to-peer -peer learning exchanges and opportunities. And so you'll, at the end of the slide, you'll note that there is a contact person that you can coordinate with to find out more about these. But this is a collaboration in which we will be working closely with a number of organizations and particularly the field agencies, both prison and jails, that have been so gracious in hosting these sites for uh, experiential learning. The second area that we're providing technical assistance and training is, is in, is in uh, direct technical assistance. We recognize that this is a effort that has to come about in which we need to have uh, at least three stages of custodial map development and implementation efforts in place. The first is planning. We recognize that sometimes it requires having somebody with that level of experience and knowledge to, to hit the ground running and to assist you. So to that effort, we've identified a series of, of technical assistance providers that can assist the jails and prisons identify the individuals and agencies that must come together as well as the common challenges that must be addressed for the successful development of the jail prison map program. While we recognize each correctional facility and the jurisdictions in which the incarcerated individuals will be least differ, map programming requires the same constellation of individuals and agencies involved in the planning process. And although specific roles will vary, site to site, it's important to have someone that can be there and to provide you assistance. And again, this is someone that um, would be facilitated through this request for technical assistance. The second area that we identified was implementation and training. Again, we have identified a cadre of providers that can provide uh, and can assist prisons and jails implement the MAP program after the planning has been completed and that the program and all its components um, so that they can be rolled out to correctional security, treatment, medical, aftercare personnel as required to implement the program. This is, uh, again, another very important offering that we think will add considerable value to your efforts in the field. 
The third is evaluation programming and ensuring fidelity to models. This is a cadre of providers that we've identified to assist in the development of metrics and data needed to provide ongoing timely feedback on the MAP program and to ensure its implementation with fidelity to the model and the program. We want to, of course, ensure that we're getting the desired results and the right proper the proper results for the population that needs to be served. So that's so that's another aspect or a second dimension of our technical assistance offering, and we fully encourage people to look at whether these would be of benefit to your organization as you continue to move forward, regardless of what stage you are in your development. Lastly, the area is information sharing. On September the 24th, the Attorney General uh, put forward a, uh, a strategy memo to address the prescription opioid and heroin epidemic. At that juncture, we were charged as the National Institute of Corrections with identifying to draft and release a document for state, local, and tribal correctional agencies which compiles the research and best practices for residential substance abuse treatment programs consistent with the conferral that we had previously secured. To that end, we have worked in collaboration with a number of organizations. The National Institute of Corrections has partnered with Bureau of Dust Systems and LNDCP and have drafted two sets of promising practice guidelines one addressing the establishment of prison and jail MAP programs and the other addressing MAP programs for justice involved populations at all criminal justice intercept points. Both sets of these guidelines are based on the latest research and standards formulated by expert practitioners from the fields of medicine, substance abuse treatment, and criminal justice. These guidelines will inform NIC in meeting the objectives previously discussed. I I, I think this is just a real exciting time, and we're very honored to be a part of this effort and very much looking to hear from the field as to how we can better serve, not only in the context of receiving that information through technical assistance requests, but additional conferrals that are planned in the future. So, Jim, thank you so very much for the opportunity to uh, share our offerings, and uh, thank you for the collaboration. Thank you so much, Stephen, and really we want to, ONDC wants to thank NIC for the really um, great leadership that they've taken in this area. So uh, great opportunities described, and um, we're really excited to see what will come of it. Uh, next we're going to turn to Kevin Pangburn, who, who is um, who's now going to present on, on the Kentucky Department of Corrections MAT program. Uh, Mr. Pangburn, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I first want to thank all those who have spoken before me for succinctly uh, summarizing our combined efforts with medically assisted treatment, both, both where we are now and, and likely where we're headed. Uh, and Kentucky is not unusual to be new to this. We're in the early stages, but it's good to know that we're part of a larger supportive network. And so I want to thank you for that. Uh, the next slide, please. <clears throat> when we uh, were first introduced to this, uh, I think many of us felt like those of us who had worked in the substance abuse treatment field for many, many, many years felt like uh, this was uh, sort of the mother mode that we needed, that next step toward pushing us toward being able to provide not only evidence-based treatment, but that assistance for when folks leave the facility to be able to give them a better opportunity. Uh, for success when they went back to their families or uh, to their, certainly to their communities. So uh, this is this description, this definition is familiar to everybody here, and uh, it's certainly not a replacement, but an assistance to all the evidence, good evidence-based work that that we've been doing all along. Uh, next slide, please. There are some advantages to Kentucky besides basketball and the Kentucky Derby, uh, you know, it's, it's really uh, interesting how substance abuse treatment has brought people together in many ways. And that is that uh, in our rural areas, particularly in, initially in the Appalachian region, uh, which now has, uh, you know, this heroin epidemic has, has spread statewide and certainly regionally, nationally, that um, for a long time, uh, we felt like that substance abuse treatment was sort of that program that was down at the end of the hallway that not many people recognized. But now we're on the map, so to speak, and 
literally I wanted to try and acknowledge the fact that every, uh, in many ways, uh, every person list here, every office, every individual, every department uh, has combined to be supportive and not only to acknowledge but to contribute to our efforts toward eradicating substance abuse and particularly uh, the heroin scourge that all of us are dealing with right now. So, you know, not, it, it's nice to be able to say that the governor's office, the cabinet secretary, certainly the general assembly is being generous with their dollars, uh, that all of these individuals are aware and educated of what's going on. They, they know what we're doing. They know the reasons behind it. Uh, they're part of the effort toward uh, solution. So that, that sometimes is unusual in a political arena, but certainly I think substance abuse and, and this recent epidemic has brought everybody together. So I want to give, certainly acknowledge that. At the same time, not lose sight of the fact that those individuals who, on a day-to-day -day basis, those line staffers out there who, who do the day-to-day -day work of uh, the evidence-based interventions with the folks who are struggling the most, those people who tend to come back the most. Uh, so I um, want to make sure that, there, that people recognize that in Kentucky there's advantages to what we've already done and what has led up to our efforts today. The drug court pilot uh, program uh, was an effort uh, by Judge Tapp uh, in a rural area part of our state a number of years ago. So we had somebody already out there sort of testing the waters, and that's proven to be an advantage for the rest of us, uh, not to mention that we are in Medicaid expansion state. Uh, next slide, please. You know, uh, when the General Assembly uh, tried a bill called the Heroin Bill, and of course uh, here that's what everyone refers to it as, the, the Heroin Bill was uh, not a second glance, but a primary resource, a primary effort by the General Assembly to assist in uh, distributing funds, providing dollars for treatment to help with the heroin problem in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. They set aside $10 million, $3 million of which came directly to the Department of Corrections. Next slide. Now, uh, those of us who have, have been in this field for a long time or even a moderate amount of time know that dollars is something that you struggle for, or whether we're looking for grants or partnerships in other ways, that to be able to be provided with $10 million was certainly a, a surprise and, and, and a, uh, a welcome resource. So, but they, the, statutorily, we were directed to not only provide medically assisted treatment uh, in our prisons, but also in our jails. And the General Assembly was wise enough to also be able to recognize that those county inmates, not just state inmates, but those county inmates, the ones who cycle through the most, those who come in on misdemeanor charges, who, or who come in and detox and then leave within a few days, uh, that they were struggling also. So there were dollars set aside for those. And, and we were tasked with not only distributing these dollars, uh, but also to provide the treatment that goes along with it. So I'll, I'll go through these next two or three slides real quick so we won't have to actually just read each and every one of them. But what it will say to us is that in prisons, in our detention centers where the Department of Corrections, our Department of Corrections, contracts with jailers around the state to uh, house state inmates along with their county inmates, that we would provide treatment, substance abuse treatment, and medically assisted treatment for those who were interested in that. So next slide, please. And this, of course, references the programs in county jails. Next slide. And uh, this, is, this is the same thing, additional funding for uh, those same programs. So now the the General Assembly was very specific about what we'd be able to use. We we uh, don't use agonists. We use uh, uh, 
uh, naltrexone only, and uh, they were very specific about how we go about this, which was fine. That, that matched our uh, philosophy as well. So, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I introduced this slide for a couple of reasons. We, our division, uh, gathers information, of course, in psychosocial when folks come into our to our programs, and we use that our our programs as a, a, that information as a way to uh, create an outcome study. We work closely with the University of Kentucky Center for Alcohol and Drug Research, and we're able to chart that over time. We follow our folks a year post release. But one of the things that happened uh, along the way were two things. Um, if you watch the blue line at the top, which references opioids, and the maroon line at the bottom, which charts heroin, in 2011, you notice a slight increase where that's where Oxycontin was reformulated. In 2012, the same thing happened with Opana. So you then begin to see an increase for heroin use. Uh, in 2012, the General, Session, uh, General Assembly Special Session, House Bill 1, uh, was to address the inappropriate prescribing of opioids. So then you begin to see, as we begin to curtail those, uh, I, I think the bill was referred to as the pill mill bill, but you begin to see that sharp incline or increase, excuse me, in heroin use to, from in just a few years, up to almost 28% of those folks who come into our programs are now using heroin. And we can target those folks. We can actually say who they are, what their names are, where they're located, et cetera, instead of just referencing uh, you know, a, a larger percentage of folks or, or recognizing maybe or referencing uh, just federal uh, numbers. Uh, next slide, please. This references the resident drug overdose. Yes. So, all right. Next. When we first uh, began the process of creating a program that included medically assisted treatment, we recognized that we had to have a a consistent protocol for those folks who entered the program. So we began to say, uh, we of course knew when people would be eligible for release, and we began to back up knowing that we had to include certain things along the way for their safety, for their welfare, for their awareness, for their education, for their appropriate uh, uh, entry into our program. And of course, like others, this is a voluntary. So we began seven weeks out with the screening process. We educated people along the way. We would um, check for naltrexone tolerance their initial medical evaluation. So we had a number of people who suddenly had to spring into action, not just the substance abuse program, but our, our uh, partners in, in the medical department, <coughs> excuse me, in security, those folks who would have to do the initial urine screens. So as we moved through this program, it, it required all those folks to be able to participate in and support our efforts the department's combined efforts with uh, medically assisted treatment. And we made a decision along the way to, uh, to also provide two injections. And, and I want to explain our reasoning behind that. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, we recognized that we, we could have done certainly one injection and then the second upon release. But we, we made a effort to say, Many people, when they would get close, those folks would thought, well, boy, this is a good idea when we, uh, when we first introduced it to them. As they began to get closer to release, even though they had, had an inject, maybe have had one injection, that draw toward their addiction, that whatever went on in the community uh, began to be a spoiler. Some people would change their mind. So we, we thought, well, well, we'll do this twice as an effort to maybe 
slow that down, talk to people closer to their release date. So we had an injection, a time span when we began to try and pay attention to recognizing that the closer they got, our words began to fade. And I know others in, in the field recognize that our words begin to fade and the street begins to talk to you in a different way. So uh, that's that was our reasoning behind doing two injections. Uh, and and I, we're going to stick with that commitment. Uh, uh, we believe that it's uh, purposeful and uh, uh, ethical to do it that way. So uh, next slide. We currently have uh, 59 people enrolled from March 16 until now. Now, you know, it was difficult for me to put this in perspective. Andy was, Andy Klein was very helpful in helping put, helping me put this into perspective, and being able to say to me that that's uh, a relatively reasonable number for somebody at this stage of the game. That there are other states too who are comparable in numbers that that have about that many enrollment. So uh, I think uh, we were uncertain when we started this, like many of us are, that uh, is there going to be a long line of people who just can't wait to get started, or will no one? And we kind of found it to be somewhere in between. We think we can impact this and, and be able to increase those numbers as we move forward. We're very hopeful for that. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> In, in uh, Kentucky, we refer to those individuals uh, who are paroled to, as uh, that are the substance abuse professionals in each probation and parole district. We have a, what we refer to as a social service clinician, that person whose sole role is to deal with the substance abusers in that area. And so prior to leaving, we, we've initiated this, prior to leaving the facility, We'll make phone contact with the parolee and the social service clinician, <clears throat> excuse me, so they have a voice, a name, location, and time. And uh, so we can sort of do that handshake over the phone, as it were, send an invitation uh, to that individual to meet with them so that all of that's taken care of prior to release. <clears throat> when, they, when they do meet with the social service clinician and the parole officer, then they'll immediately their their task is twofold. One, to implement uh, Medicaid accessibility and establish a, an appointment for a follow-up injection. And then whatever else their aftercare plan is and they'll remain in some sort of follow-up treatment as they move forward. Next slide. And these are the locations of where we have substance abuse programs and MAT programs. So we are uh, in prisons and jails. Um, I think I'd also like to say that we have, uh, particularly at Louisville Metro, that we, uh, where we have county inmates who simply come in, detox, and leave, that uh, their director at Louisville Metro has initiated a plan with the community mental health agency where he can now ask for volunteers, people can come in once they detox, be able to provide injection and immediately move them across town to a treatment program where they'll receive treatment as well as their second injection. So it's sort of a creative way to stem that flow of just a revolving door of uh, be arrested, uh, undergo detox, and then back out on the street only to repeat that same cycle again. So we're, we're real encouraged by that and hopefully we can be able to implement that in other areas as well. So that's all I have. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Director Pangburn. That's such a, you have really a fascinating, um, comprehensive initiative going on in Kentucky and we're so thrilled you were able to share it on this webinar with all the people who've joined us. So thanks so much. Okay, next we're going to hear from Kimberly Kane, uh, who's going to provide an overview of the Rhode Island Department of Corrections MAT program. Ms. Kane? Hi, good afternoon. Thank Hi. you so much for having Rhode Island with you today. My name is Kimberly Kane. I'm a nurse practitioner at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections. And you can go to the next slide. 
So the Rhode Island Department of Corrections is a unified correctional system. It houses an average of 3,100 inmates that consists of awaiting trial, sentenced, and community corrections, which all fall under the DOC jurisdiction. On average, the monthly awaiting trial population census runs anywhere between six and 700, and the average length of stay is 23 days, with a median length of stay being about three days. Next slide. In 2014, Rhode Island was identified as having the sixth highest opioid overdose rate in the nation. And in 2014-15, 21% of all of those overdose victims were incarcerated within the two years prior to their overdose death. In response, the governor signed an action plan with the primary goal to decrease over to over overdose deaths. The four-step process, which you'll see on the right-hand side, was to include prevention, rescue, recovery, and treatment. And several of these steps are obviously essential to implement in the correctional setting. Rescue specifically aimed to increase access to naltrexone. The Rhode Island Department of Correction immediate, to Corrections immediately started a mandatory overdose prevention class for all new intakes and also began educated, educating and dispensing to take home naloxone kits for every patient that expressed an interest. The treatment portion aimed to expand quality and availability of MAT, in which the government allocated $2.5 million in the fiscal year set budget for the state prison. Recovery aims to expand access to peer recovery services and MAT to ensure patients with substance use disorders receive discharge and recovery planning. Recommendations for the, for the Department of Corrections include screening, for opioid use disorders, as well as continuation of MAT for all patients already engaged in treatment, and initiation of MAT as indicated for new commitments and prior to release, along with community referrals for continued treatment. Next slide. Prior to the implementation of the MAT program, all individuals that fell into one of these four categories were placed on a medication-assisted withdrawal protocol. People that came in on methadone would get seven days of maintenance medication, the same dose they were receiving in the community, and they would be placed on a rapid taper. The three other categories you see here were all placed directly on the withdrawal protocol. The screening that took place for substance use disorders was self-disclosed during a nursing intake, and those patients would be placed on, again, the medication-assisted withdrawal protocol. In early 2014, the Department of Corrections amended the methadone withdrawal protocol and started maintaining the community dose of methadone for patients that were sentenced to 60 days or less. Our take-home naloxone and Vivitrol program began in the Rhode Island Department of Corrections in early 2015. Next slide. Pre-implementation, the Department of Corrections staff screened 419 individuals within two weeks of incarceration and found that about 75% screened positive for likely substance use disorder and 26% reported frequent opiate use. The goals of our MAT program are, um, our screening goal is all new commitments to the DOC will be screened using a validated tool and then referred appropriately to either induction or follow-up for pre-release planning. Patients with prescriptions for methadone and buprenorphine will be maintained on treatment for up to one year. If the patient screens positive for an opioid use disorder, a, clinician, a clinical assessment determines if they're appropriate for MAT. And case management and discharge planning will be done for all patients that have been identified as having an opioid use disorder. Next slide. During screening, there are three ways that we hope to identify patients that can be included in the program. The first is with the nursing commitment in which a substance use history is taken. If the patient screens positive at that point, the nurse directly refers to the MAT program. If upon commitment the patient reports already being in treatment, the meds are confirmed and then the patient's dose is maintained. They are typically dosed the very next day. 
within one to three days, the, the other way that patient can be identified would be through self-identifying. If they chose not to answer the questions during the commitment process or during the screening at any other point in their incarceration, they may in fact identify it as having a substance use disorder and then again be referred to the appropriate MAT counselor. Within one to three days, the TCU-5 screening tool is administered. It's a self-administered tool and it's a validated tool that screens for mild to severe substance use disorder. It's particularly useful in our population to determine placement and level of care and treatment. If they screen positive, they're also referred to the MAT program and seen by a counselor. At that point, after being seen by the counselor, they'll be referred to a provider for induction. Next slide. The awaiting trial and patients that have an unknown length of stay will start treatment typically immediately after medical examination if it's appropriate. A sentenced patient that's serving less than one year will start treatment immediately, and a patient that is likely sentenced to greater than one year will start substance abuse counseling and be slated to start treatment 90 days prior to release. Maintenance is seamless upon commitment and the dose after dose confirmation, so those patients usually don't need to be directly referred or wait to start treatment. The case manager follows all patients on treatment to ensure they attend groups, and during induction until stabilization, the patient is required to attend three group sessions per week. After stabilization, the patient will require to continue ending group, attending group sessions at least monthly. So far, we found that even after the patients have been stabilized, they still want to continue weekly group sessions, which they're welcome to do. In terms of making the appropriate choice for medications, typically we are doing that on an individual basis. Um, the consideration is when they sit down with the provider to discuss their history of addiction, meds that they've previously tried or failed, their ability to comply with their regimen. Um, especially in considering when they'll be leaving and, you know, do they need a structured program or do they have a history of chronic pain, all of the things that may be considered um, barriers to them con the continuity of care when they... Typically, for a rule of thumb, when we start people on buprenorphine we, uh, and they haven't been on treatment, so maybe the pre-release patient that has been incarcerated for greater than one year and it's been determined that they would be best suited to go back into the community on treatment, we'd start them with um, a four and one dosing and then go to eight and two and then stay at 16 and two until they're released. And then for methadone, we would typically start at 20 milligrams, increase by about three grams every three days until they reach about 50 milligrams and then they'd have a reevaluation. Uh, the case manager is also an insurance navigator, and so they have begun enrolling patients in, in the insurance prior to their release from incarceration. And all patients on treatment are already considered patients in the community treat, pre, treatment program that we contract with, so they are dosed the very next day upon release. They also will follow up with the case management piece in the community so that if the patient would prefer to transfer to a different provider or other treatment program, they'll facilitate um, that working out for the patient in the community. Next slide. Collaboration has been a key factor to our success this far. With our community um, opioid treatment provider contract, they provide the screening, the counselors, um, they do medical, some medical intakes for the treatment and induction, and case management and discharge planning. They also dispense the methadone and, and buprenorphine naltrexone daily, and the DOC staff nurses administer the doses. We've developed a, a lot of community partnerships for seamless transition of care upon reentry, which is critical. The patients are seen the next day at the treatment provider, as I said, and then they're assisted with the transfer if they choose. We also have worked closely with Brown University so that we can work on program evaluation. Our program, such as many, is still in its infancy stages, so we're just at the beginning of some data collection um, moving towards process evaluation. The DOC leadership in both healthcare services and corrections has been instrumental in the program development and implementation. 
The collaboration between security and medical staff has been one of the single most important factors in our success. The DOC heavily supports the program. They've eagerly stepped forward to develop you know, operating procedures for medlines and times and locations. And we like to think that we have an open forum for process improvement, which has already led to several changes in the process. One of, um, an example of that process change would be when we first started the program, we were using the buprenorphine tabs, um, and the patients would have about a 20-minute time frame of directly observed therapy through security, which was taking a long time, and it was leading to an increased amount of diversion. With that feedback, we changed to the buprenorphine naltrexone films, and the feedback has been positive so far. It's decreased the amount of time that the therapy needs to be observed from about 20 minutes to about five. Next slide. In terms of our progress, our numbers are still um, trickling in. We have just started with our full implementation. As you see on the left-hand side of the screen, pre-implementation goes from August of 2015 through August of 2016. At this point, we're capturing most patients that have only been maintained on methadone for that seven-day window. And then as you see, the slide goes from the June to August at the later part of the slide on 2016. That's when we began our first phase of the implementation in which we included patients for methadone maintenance. Our numbers obviously have steadily rose since that time. Moving into December on the right-hand side of the screen, December of 2016, we were able to capture about our first full month of the full MAT program rollout, including those being started on the commitment as well as pre-release and maintenance. During December of 2016, there was 232 individuals that received MAT. 64 of the December commitments continued from the community. 25 of the commitments initiated and 135 were continued from the previous month, as well as eight that were started on treatment prior to release. This information likely does not include our Vivitrol program, which had already, we had been collecting data on in a separate entity. Next slide. So for process improvement, We've begun to note that there are areas where we could certainly improve and help streamline the continued success of our program. In anticipation of the program start, we began the MAT referral process weeks before our implementation was underway, thus starting off with a backlog of patients to be seen, many whom were already through withdrawal and looking for discharge planning. Word also travels fast in the correctional community, so we almost immediately began receiving self-referrals as well as inquiries about getting on treatment. With the limited provider time and a small staff allotted to counseling groups and screening, there is still what we consider too long of a wait to be seen. At any given time, you may wait up to three days for screening and then one to three weeks for a provider visit to get on treatment. Unfortunately, that means there's still a vulnerable population that may not be getting into treatment prior to release. Patient requests for dose adjustments um, are also very difficult. We need to be making choices in triaging which patients are seen for induction, which patients are going to be triaged for a follow-up for dose adjustments, and that puts another strain on our already small staff. Currently, our screening is on paper, and in the future, we do plan to move to the tablet format, which would be self-administered on a tablet and hopefully fed directly into our EMR and that will hopefully decrease the amount of manpower workload that process takes. Some of the issues with screening that we've noticed is that there are exclusions. Um, the lists need to be made for who's going to be seen for screening, and that list needs to go through a security clearance, so it can only be done Tuesday through Friday. Therefore, we're missing a population that comes in from Friday through Sunday and then leaves to go to court on Monday. This li these lists of people that need to be screened also include, in exclude patients that maybe initially in had their intake and then were placed on a medical observation, psychiatric observation, discipline, or are in and out of court. We're still getting started um, with consideration for using urine, urine screening as an adjunct to our screening. 
one of the other issues is sharing of information as not to duplicate efforts. As we all know, on the outside, HIPAA, um, with our outpatient treatment providers, community providers, and issues with some medication not actually being reflected in the prescription monitoring program for those that are going to opiate treatment providers in the community, um, sometimes can cause a lag in the maintenance phase. In addition, our community provider that's come into our facilities to start doing these screenings and seeing patients, we are trying to gain access for computers and shared workspace and being able to share two-way communication so that work isn't duplicated. Currently, the dosing schedule for our buprenorphine and naltrexone methadone treatment programs are for PM dosing. And so they're dosed pretty late in the evening to afternoon. And so we do receive a moderate amount of requests for time of day change or people aren't sleeping, some of which is hard to obviously decide if it's related to mental health issues or if it is, in fact, just a dose. And so we're getting feedback on that at this point. Addressing diversion is on a one-to-one -one basis and we try to meet the community standard and respect the, the aspects that obviously impact the security here in the department. Another piece as we move forward will be program surveillance and me metrics um, for quality improvement and obviously sustainability. Next slide. Some of the acknowledgments for um, our success here at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections. Um, and I'd like to just acknowledge Dr. A.T. Um, Wall as you know a big, big supporter of our program and has helped us to be where we are today. Next slide. Thank you. We're going to address questions at the end. Well, thank you so very much, Acting Medical Director Kane. That was really a great presentation, and uh, we're really thrilled to see this really interesting model that's being implemented in Rhode Island. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Andy Klein from RSAT, who's now going to briefly recap, facilitate a short Q&A, and provide some information on how to request uh, assistance implementing, enhancing, or expanding MAT. Dr. Klein? Great. Thanks, June. Um, RSAT, as people may know, it's the federally funded prison and jail substance abuse treatment program. It's in the, awarded by the uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance, and they have trusted advocates for human potential where I work for the last six years to provide technical assistance. And so one thing that I've seen, and I've been with the project for six years, is a trem tremendous expansion of MAT in jails and prisons. Um, and uh, well, this is uh, the, the, the enthusiastic questions we received in registration. We got over 69 questions, I think, is a testament to that. And not only were they questions, but they were obviously cool very questions of concerned people who had very intelligent questions and unfortunately our time is running out so we're not going to have uh, uh, enough time to answer all of them. But we'll try to... Andy, Andy, you can go for a few minutes. I mean we have a oh, little okay. bit of room on the end. All right, right. We're good, good. Let me just summarize a little bit. What we heard is why this is so important. We know that what we've been doing pre-MAT doesn't work. We know that half of inmates do not show up for post-release treatment at least two times within 30 days, and of those who do show up, less than half then complete the active care program. So we've, we have a chronic inability, no matter how well we do in our correctional treatment programs, making sure they continue outside once the inmates are released. And we know that inpatient treatment dissipates very quickly if it's not a follow-up in the community. We also know that a lot of the prison, the, the prison crowding in 19, that started in the 1980s and just uh, expanded uh, were not necessarily people committing new crimes, but we're recycling the same offenders who are creating technical violations in their parole and probation, and most of those are treatment failures. When they developed in the 1980s, low-cost uh, urine testing, that was, you look, the, the technical uh, revocations uh, went way up. So we've got to end that cycle of the same people coming in and out of our correctional institutions. And also, uh, Mary um, Lou talked about the death rate of 12.9%. That should be, I'm sorry, 14 days, not 24 days. 
that is the overall death rate for inmates for all causes. But if you look at the death rate specifically for opioid use disorder overdose death, it's over 170 times, not 12.9, but 117 times higher for the correctional population. Next, next slide. So that's why we, this is so important, what you're doing or, uh, or what Kentucky and uh, Rhode Island have done and others are doing. Also, we know as this becomes evidence-based treatment, it becomes uh, a legal requirement, increasingly a uh, legal requirement that, these, uh, that this medication be made available. And we can no longer just say, well, we don't want to deal with this. We have to deal with this. Next slide. So why don't we get to some of your questions. Uh, and uh, there were 69 questions. I've gone through them. I've eliminated the questions that were addressed. And so I'll just talk to some of the questions, ask some of the questions uh, uh, to, uh, that were not addressed. Um, first of all, a, a concern by a, several of you was, can you do this MAT program in a pretrial population where inmates come and go very quickly, and I think we've already answered that because you're doing that in Kentucky, Kevin, is that correct? Correct. Yes, we're doing that in a little metro. Yep, and that's your largest local jail for a pretrial population, I would assume, in Kentucky? Yes. Okay, good. Um, okay, another question is for the co-occurring population. We know there's a huge overlap between mental illness and substance use disorders. How stable or, or how do you screen or can people with co-occurring conditions, are they eligible for MAT, uh, Kimberly, in Rhode Island? Absolutely. In Rhode Island, we the first intake that would happen would be the screening with nursing. And naturally, if there was an acute psychiatric disorder that needed to be addressed, the patient would likely be seen by psychiatry services prior to getting into our MAT program. However, no one is limited because they have coexisting psychiatric conditions. Um, Kevin, in your program is limited to, uh, to naltrexone. What if the inmate uh, wants an agonist medication or thinks that that's what they need to, stay, to, re to, to, to maintain sobriety when they get released? Well, you know, I, I never want to put myself or any of our staff in a position of making a medical decision that we're not trained to do, whether it's uh, pharmacology or whether it, it, it's simply making de decisions like that. I think it puts us in a bad position. But uh, So if an individual says, who is under the care, ongoing care of a physician, that they would rather utilize an agonist than we support that. Whatever works, works. Uh, at the same time, I think that we would be cautious uh, and have a conversation with that physician so that they understood uh, that the individual is indeed uh, under supervision. So, yeah, we're, we're okay with that. As long as when, they're, when they are in the facilities, when they're in our prisoner jails, then uh, you know, we have, we're a one-stop shop. Once they leave and they're on the street, then certainly we're open to discussion on that. And I think uh, uh, some of the more mature programs in Massachusetts, they've been doing this for three years. I think their statistics are about 10% of those released on naltrexone, on the injectable naltrexone or Vivitrol, uh, do switch to agonist medication uh, a month after they're released. Um, one of the questions was, how do you sell or how do you uh, sell inmates uh, on MAT? Are they reluctant to enroll? Um, Kevin, Kimberly, want to address that? In Rhode Island, the program is voluntary. We do multiple, we try to do multiple different screening modalities and the patients get referred for counseling. So at, at that point, they're educated and given the resources they need to try to make a decision. If they decide to opt out, it's a fluid process. They can certainly decide to opt back in at any point and we'll get them going with the process. So it is voluntary. I think that part of the the implementation in and of itself, we saw that there was a large influx of requests to start treatment once 
people started staying on treatment and getting on treatment. And I think that the community as a whole in corrections, um, as you come in and you have a substance use disorder and you're not feeling well and you don't know what your options are and you have maybe a cellmate or someone that's in close to who is on treatment, that can almost become somewhat of a therapeutic community in encouraging people to explore the option. Um, so we hope that that will be the process moving forward, is that there will be enough reinforcement with the people that are on treatment to encourage those that maybe had opted out at the beginning. But at this point, it is voluntary. And Kevin, I think you were talking before a little bit before we started this call about the role of families. Right. Uh, first of all, I was fortunate enough last summer to be in Rhode Island and, and witness the programs that Kimberly speaks of, and her, her staff did it. An, an excellent job in doing just exactly what she described. Uh, we too are uh, voluntary, but we also know, we, we begin to notice over time that uh, all the information regarding medically assisted treatment, and it, well initially, uh, came from us. Uh, the the uh, substance abuse staff would inform the potential clients of what was available, but now we're hearing clients say to us that their families are aware of this either at, uh, by mail or visitation. They're encouraging those individuals who are in substance abuse programming to utilize this. And I think in some ways, it, uh, you know, people have to have an approved home placement. And I think some families may be saying, you know, if you want to come home, then this would be an asset to you to ensure that things could be better when you do. And uh, I think also it's just testimony to a more informed public people find this information that they need, and this is a good example of it. Uh, I think the other thing, too, is that just utilizing the skills that we have when we talk to our uh, folks when we were initially informing them, utilizing motivational interviewing questions uh, or motivational interviewing conversations that, uh, you know, spawns answers other than just yes or no. Okay, that's, ter that's terrific. I know in Pennsylvania, uh, Department of Corrections, when they started their program, they developed fact sheets that they give to inmates, but they also developed fact sheets on MAT that they give to the families, so the families understand what's going on and can support the inmate in their decision. Another question came up, uh, what about juveniles? Can juveniles have MAT? And we discussed this issue before. All the programs we're talking about now are for adults, uh, which are 18 and over. I think you'd have to check uh, whether the uh, FDA uh, says these, pro these medications are indicated for juveniles. I don't believe they are. Um, but at any rate, we only have the authority right now and experience to talk about these for adults, which in these two systems are 18 and above. Um, another question, uh, and Kimberly, you talked about this a little bit, is what you did to uh, cut down on contraband by switching from the pill to the film for your, for your uh, buprenorphine uh, medication. Do we have, either of you have any anecdotal information? Has this, um, especially in Rhode Island, since you have this agonist medication that you're introducing in the prison, has this increased contraband? Uh, has your correctional security staff raised all sorts of alarms? Or do you have any feedback on that yet? I don't believe that we've, we certainly haven't had the feedback that since we've changed to the films um, that there has been any increase in contraband or um, I feel like we have had a pretty open and fluid back and forth with security as we've implemented the process and that hasn't been something that has come up. Okay, good. But you haven't seen when you start to introduce methadone and Suboxone and Naltrex in the prison, there hasn't been a uh, crisis of contraband and uh, concern, uh, you know, major problems that have been associated with these programs? We have not here in Rhode Island. Okay. Yeah, and that's pretty common across the country. Another question was on Vivitrol, how many shots are indicated? Uh, how long should we recommend that uh, people, when they're released, stay on shots? And just to save time, let me just answer that. There is no science behind that. We don't know. Um, so we can't say, well, two shots will do the trick or three shots. I mean, some people stay sober without any shots. Some people have been on the program from Missouri now and have been on shots for over 18 months and feel they still need it. So we still don't know that uh, yet. Um, 
obviously it takes a while for the brain to readjust. It's a brain disease, so presumably uh, multiple shots are necessary. Uh, but again, the answer is that we really don't know. Um, Kevin, Kimberly, do you want to add anything on that? Have you come up with any magic answers? I don't have a magic answer. I, I can only speak to what we watched, and that is uh, just exactly what you described, Andy. Okay. Okay, great. Can people on medication, when they're released, uh, are they welcome at AA and NA meetings? Um, and the answer is uh, yes, but. Um, if you look at the blue book for AA by the Central Committee, they welcome people on medication. That's not precluding somebody. However, as people know who have been involved in AA or NA, every local group has its own personality or culture, and some are a little concerned about people on medication. Others are very welcoming. So there's, again, the answer is yes, but there may be some groups that are more, more welcoming than others. Do physicians have to be certified to prescribe buprenorphine and naltrexone? The answer is yes for buprenorphine, and recently Congress enlarged that to its physicians, nurses, and I forget the other, medical practitioners, I think they're called, are licensed to prescribe it. Uh, naltrexone, you don't need, any doctor can prescribe naltrexone, however, many are unfamiliar with the medication and don't stock it. Uh, so uh, you don't have to be certified, but you have to find a uh, physician in the community that's willing and able to um, prescribe it. Uh, Andy, uh, just for clarification, uh, NPs, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants in states that allow them to prescribe can prescribe. Oh, okay. So, it's, uh, so you have to check your state law. I'm sorry. Yeah. I missed yeah, you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, physicians uniformly can do it who have, who have been certified. Um, okay, and uh, Kimberly, I think you were saying in Rhode Island, uh, who, who does the prescribing for your buprenorphine or methadone for inmates who uh, are inducted into the uh, MAT program? Currently, we have a joint force here doing that. We have the community provider that we've contracted with for the program does have provider, a provider that comes and will see patients and start with induction. We also have providers, physicians here that also have been certified to be able to see these patients for their intakes and start them on treatment. And okay. because the medication is actually dispensed through the community provider, all of our prescriptions go through the medical director for that facility, and it's considered an opioid treatment provider. So here we are typically, we, we consider it courtesy dosing, where we're ordering the medication for them. So their medical director is looking over our orders and essentially making sure that we're following the community standard guidelines for prescribing. And their medical director is certified, obviously. Correct. Yeah. Now, for the methadone, you're not, are you a licensed methadone clinic, or how do you, how do you uh, administer methadone in your facilities? Our community provider that we contract with is a licensed methadone clinic. So, so in effect, you subcontract to them to do your methadone program. And they and then they also do the the buprenorphine and naltrexone. Okay. So Great. they just they actually deliver the medication to us, and the nurses are the ones that dispense the medication. Okay. One last medication. question. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. That wasn't me. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, one last question to you, Kevin. What about uh, uh, poly drug abusers who are also uh, dabbling with cocaine or methamphetamines or alcoholic? Uh, how do you deal with them in your in uh, Kentucky prison substance abuse programs? Like we always have, uh, you know, we almost all of our folks, and I think everyone else would echo this. Those of us who do this job would find that almost all of our folks are poly substance abusers anyway. Uh, so we're going to continue on the uh, same wavelength that we always have, and we'll deal with the medically assisted treatment as it relates to opioids and heroin and still focus on their other use as well. Okay, great. Okay, next slide please. 
the last question was who else is doing this? And these are some just quick slides. There are 13 state prison systems that we know of right now that have some sort of MAT program. Not all as robust as Rhode Island's, uh, but uh, a lot of them doing uh, Vivitrol, uh, either one shot or two shots, and some like uh, New Hampshire do oral naltrexone on maintenance for a month and then do a shot on the way out. Next slide, please. And there are another, uh, uh, there are another 10 program states where they have announced or are in the plans of developing a pilot or uh, initiating a, uh, a MAT program. Next slide. Uh, there are currently, and I have the number from Kentucky wrong, so there are currently 141 jail MAT reentry programs that are springing up, and this changes week to week. Uh, next slide. And those are mostly, those are Vivitrol programs. Uh, and in addition, these are jail programs and state programs that also do methadone and buprenorphine. And this doesn't include a lot of prisons do methadone just for uh, pregnant inmates. Uh, but these are uh, broader uh, methadone programs in, in Kentucky and Vermont, Rhode Island, uh, and Alaska. Next slide. OK, today's takeaway from the very excellent presentations and the work from Kentucky and Rhode Island and their peers in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts and elsewhere We've learned three things, that MAT should and can be available to all persons with opioid alcohol use disorders, especially incarcerated persons. There's no reason to exclude this population anymore. It can be done, is being done, uh, and it works. Second, offering MAT to incarceration requires prison jail administrators to restructure current responses and work with community-based substance use disorder treatment providers, state Medicaid and health insurance administrators to offer and cover the full panoply of FDA-approved medications. So the programs begin in prison, but they have to continue into the community. And that requires financing, and that requires a warm handoff, as you've heard about, to community treatment and medication providers. And third, the big issue in corrections is the issue of diversion can be can be addressed by well-run uh, correctional programming. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this is just a repeat of the slide that uh, Stephen showed. These are where you can go for follow-up TA from NIC. And these, uh, June will tell us later on, these are, you, you'll, you don't have to write this down now. This will be available to you. Next slide. In addition to NIC, uh, the uh, BGA contracted uh, uh, TA provider, which is the Advocate for Human Potential, had this website. And on that, you will find we have now redesigned it to have a whole section on MAT, and it, will, it includes the um, protocols from uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Kentucky, et cetera. It includes a training film from Pennsylvania, Missouri, and Massachusetts. Uh, plus some other ones that have been developed in counties uh, that may will be of interest to you. Next slide. It also includes a generic uh, manual uh, that basically we took elements of the manuals developed in the first three prison programs and we created a generic uh, manual that's available. You can download it for the website, which may be of use. Next slide, which is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Klein. Um, so finally, I would just like to thank our extraordinary presenters and to thank each of you for joining us today. We hope you found this session valuable and will take steps to implement similar approaches in your facilities. This concludes our webinar. Uh, I want to mention we will make the slides available and, and the link to the recording for everyone to share with their um, colleagues and friends. <laughs> Thanks so much. Have a great day.